Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. So why do men like to fight? Why do we like to compete? Whether it's boxing or MMA, football, basketball, any of the other type of... We'll, we'll come up with a competition for anything. Not only that, why do we like to watch other men fight and to compete? What's going on there? Well, our guest today is an English professor that wanted to find the answers to those questions, so he decided to train to become an MMA fighter. His name is John Gottschall. He's the author of the book, The Professor in the Cage, Why Men Fight and Why We Like to Watch. And this is one of the best books I've read so far this year, and one of the best books about masculinity I've read. He weaves in a story about his training to become an MMA fighter with anthropological, biological, sociological studies about male violence, male competition, and male status. And it just provides a lot of fascinating insights to how these aspects of masculinity have shaped men throughout time, throughout cultures. And he makes the provocative case that ritualized combat, whether it's boxing or MMA, competition in you know, violent sports like football, serve a role in society and actually a pro-social role. So we're going to talk about what role violence should have in a man's life, even in the modern world. Uh, again, it's a fascinating, provocative argument and discussion. I think you're really going to like this one. So let's do this. John Gottschall, the professor in the cage. Jonathan Gottschall, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you having me on. All right. So your book is The Professor in the Cage, Why Men Fight and Why We Like to Watch. So the first question is naturally how you're an English professor by trade. Uh, how did an English professor end up training to become an MMA fighter and explore violence and masculinity? Uh, I guess three or four years ago, um, I was, I, I just said an English professor, but I was an adjunct English professor at a small liberal arts school. And I uh, had never managed to find my way onto the tenure track, and I was kind of finally facing the fact that I was basically never going to. So I was at midlife, and I needed a new path through life, but I didn't know what it should be. And then one day I was at my office hours, and I was kind of pacing around. I look out the front window, and this new business had moved in across the street, and it's called Mark Schrader's Academy of Mixed Martial Arts. It's a cage fighting gym. And I could look across the street, you know, about as far as I could throw a snowball, and I could see the guys in there in the cage, and they're dancing around, they're hitting, they're tackling, they're rolling. And I was just ambushed by this powerful sense of envy. You know, I envied those young guys over there who seemed so alive in their cage while here I was across the street, you know, rotting away in my office cubicle. And then I had this kind of funny thought, and the thought was, wouldn't it be funny if I went across the street and joined them? Me, you know, this, you know, chubby, 40-year-old, never been in a fight, English professor. And then my next thought was, of course, well, maybe that's my new path in life. Maybe there's a book in that, you know, a sort of nonfiction fight club, a book about the allure of violence. And so a couple months later, I worked up my courage. I crossed the street, uh, tried to learn how to fight, and uh, wrote the book. What did your fellow colleagues think of this? Um, you know, it's funny. You know, when I when I said that, my I had this fantasy of crossing the street to to learn how to fight, and initially the the fantasy was a career suicide fantasy. I was hoping that my colleagues would see me, you know, fighting in the cage, and they would say, "Oh, this is beyond the pale of academic respectability. We, we must fire this guy." And so it was kind of like this uh, career suicide fantasy I was having. But my colleagues, unfortunately, were a lot more tolerant than I hoped, uh, and uh, they didn't they didn't fire me over. They thought it was kind of funny, yeah. and uh, they were pretty supportive in the end. I'm interested to see what the rest of uh, the sort of intellectual uh, academic world is going to make of the book once they get a hold of it, um, whether they'll see it as sort of this, uh, I don't know, glorification of barbarism, or if they'll see it as a more thoughtful project that I intended. Have you got any feedback from other academics? Not yet. You know, the book has only been out for a few days. You know, I've had a few reviews, but not from sort of the most pointy-headed intellectuals. Sure. I'm sure that will come come soon. 
Yeah. Uh, what did your wife think of this? You know, your your dad, you got two daughters, you're 40 years old. Uh, was she kind of worried about this? <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, at first, you know, I, I didn't even want to tell her. I was, I was embarrassed to even confess this to her. But eventually I kind of had to. And I'm like, you know, well, you know, I just kind of told her my whole dumb plan for trying to become a cage fighter. And she said, you know, first she kind of wanted to see if I was joking or not. And then she said, well, you know, you know, you don't have any skills. You'll be killed, uh, she said. Um, and it always hurts to have your, you know, wife question your skills. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um but eventually she sort of, you know, came around to it and she got so comfortable with it. In fact, that I, it, it depressed me. I'd be like, you know, I don't know, my shoulder hurts and I can't see straight. I got hit so hard today. And I just, I'd want to whine about it or something. And she'd be like, you know, did you unload the dishwasher? <laughs> and I'd think, my God, woman, don't you love me at all? Aren't you, don't you worry about me at all? She got, she got used to it. She was very supportive. That's great. So did you have any assumptions about male violence going into this experiment? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I was going in partially to verify a theory that I had, and the theory was basically that MMA was this metaphor for something really dark and rotten in human nature, something black and violent, you know? Um, I had all the stereotypes that most people had, uh, that the fighting was was bad, um, and that it, you know, that the fighters must be I don't know, bullies or sociopaths or sadists at the least. And I just didn't find that at all. You know, almost all of my assumptions going in were overturned by the process of doing the research, of meeting the guys, of fighting myself. And basically, you know, guys don't go into mixed martial arts because they're dreaming of hurting people. You know, they don't they don't do it because they fantasize about or they take some kind of pleasure in doing violence. Most guys get into it, I believe, because they're attempting to defeat a weakness and timidity inside themselves. You know, these are guys who are in need of a quest and mixed martial arts gives them that quest. Yeah, there aren't really opportunities for quest for men. And in like the traditional we think of masculine quest, right? That's right. That's right. You know, if you, you have a world where the the world is getting safer and safer, you know, it's getting softer and softer, uh, and the traditional masculine virtues are hold, held in lower and lower regard. And there's very few places where a, a young guy, and it's overwhelmingly young guys that do this, can go to get a sort of rite of passage uh, into manhood. And I think that's what a lot of these guys are seeking. Yeah. They're seeking some sort of test of their courage in their character. They want to know if they're real men Yeah, in, in, in that traditional sense. Yeah. And to your point about, um, you know, MMA fighters not being bullies, like my experience with MMA fighters, like there's some like the, the nicest people I've ever encountered. Totally. Like, super friendly. Yeah. And just it totally, I mean, it's, it's not what you think you'd, you'd, you'd kind of think you'd have these kind of just jerks, but like, they're just like the nicest guys in the world. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I don't know if it attracts nice guys. I think partly it's the culture of MMA. It's a martial arts culture, which is based on respect. Um, but there's also something like, you know, inside the gym, it really pays to be nice because if you're not nice, people beat you up worse. You know, <laughs> they don't want to work with you. You, you, you. you need to play nice inside the gym. And also, I think outside the gym, I think these guys are at pains to put people at ease. They don't want, they, they want to, they want to make a very strong, uh, display of the fact that even though I'm a mean person in that cage, I'm a very nice person out, outside the cage and you don't need to be uncomfortable and you don't need to be worried. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about some of the, um, cause you know, you, you, you weave in your story about training with all this fantastic research about masculinity and, and particularly how it relates to violence. And I love you start off the book talking about honor and it sort yeah. of underlies what, violence, what role violence plays in masculinity. So what, what role does honor play in male violence? And I guess the first thing would be, how do you, how do you define honor in this sense? Cause I think most people have a d definition of honor. That's not what you're talking about. Yeah. Honor is, is it, I think it's, it's always been a sort of fuzzy concept, always been sort of hard for people to put their finger on what they mean. But honor, uh, if you, if you substitute the word respect, you won't be far, far wrong. Um, so, so a man of honor is a man who, dan who demands to be respected. Uh, and, you know, so the, the, most, the, the most classic honor dispute is the formal aristocratic European duel, 
where a man feels dishonored. He says to his opponent, "You must apologize to that for this. If you don't, if you won't do it, we're going to have a gunfight or a sword fight at dawn." Now, the classic European duel is dead. No one does that anymore. But we still duel. We still have the, the duel in the sense of an escalating dispute over honor is still the leading cause of conflict and violence and even homicide among men. You know, so for example, you're at the bar, some guy walks past you, you clip shoulders, somebody spills their drink, someone insults someone. Um, and before you know it, it's escalated to uh, beer bottles uh, uh, to the top of the head. That is, in a way, a duel. In that, in that limited sense I'm talking about, it's a, it's, a, it's a dispute over honor that gets out of control. Gotcha. And I, I love how you talk too. We've, we've had a, a, a professor of, uh, who specializes in like civil war honor. And she mm-hmm. talked about the difference between uh, like aristocratic duels and like the lower class duels, like the rough and tumbles. I think you talk yeah, about rough that. And tumbles, amazing, you, isn't you it? talk about that in your book, right? Yeah. And it's just yeah, yeah. no holds bar. Basically you, you're, the whole point is to gouge someone's eye out. That was, that was like the touchdown pass. Yeah. Yeah. It was called it was called feeling for a feller's eye strings. Oh, God. And the idea was to <laughs> the idea was to you know get your thumbs into the corners of the eyes and pop out the whole eyeball so it's oh. bouncing around on the string. Man. Okay. Yeah. When I read that, it just made me <laughs> wince in pain. Yeah. But that is an example yeah. of a duel, but for lower class. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. Class. So the, yeah. 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 So the duel is dead. Uh, people say. But the duel is only dead in that sort of stuffy, elaborate, aristocratic form. There's various other kinds and other forms of the duel um, that, that, that still exist today. You talk about how duels and the other forms that exist today are basically ritualized violence. Yeah. And that these forms of ritualized violence uh, actually have a benefit society. So can you talk, explain what you mean by ritualized violence and how does this actually keep violence in check? Sure. Well, you know, so, again, the history of the duel, so if you have historians talking about the duel, they usually go back 500 years or so uh, in Europe. But they really need to go back millions of years. So if you've seen a couple of elephant seals clashing in the surf on, like, a nature video, or a couple of rams squaring off and cracking skulls on the hillside in a nature video, that's what biologists call ritual combat. It's this way that many, many different species have evolved to decide who's the bigger, stronger, fitter animal without the dangers of fighting it out to the death. And what I argue in the book is that that the same is true of people, only more so. So yeah, humans are a complicated, complex animal, but we're animals still. And the term I have for this is called the monkey dance. And the monkey dance is my term for human versions of ritual combat, everything from, you know, formal duels to dead, like deadly duels, to verbal duels, to the play fights of boys, to sports. But probably the best example of this is again going back to that bar. So if you have uh, the choreography of a standard fist fight, so a fist fight almost always goes the same way. It's been studied by sociologists pretty extensively, and they almost always have the same sort of patterns. It begins with some sort of insult, some sort of trespass. A man will feel dishonored, disrespected. There's a challenge. They close the distance. There's a push. Uh, at any time, either man can call it off and sit, walk away, say, I'm sorry. But if he won't, it'll escalate to a real fight. There'll be a push. There'll be a punch. There'll be a tackle. They'll roll around, roll around on the ground and, and gouge each other. So the choreography of a standard fist fight, the back and forth dance of it, the, the moves that, that, that people carry out, seem to be about as hardwired into us as those two rams cracking skulls on a uh, mountainside. Now, the, the key is that all this stuff looks silly. It looks ridiculous. It looks pathetic. And sometimes it ends in tragedy. But for the most part, our monkey dances are a good thing. They keep our contests civilized. And without Without codes and rules and rituals to govern the way that men compete and even the way that men fight, the world would be quite a lot more dangerous and uh, dark. Yeah, and it, I mean, guess you know, kind of was my next question I was going to ask you is like, you know, are there downsides? It seems like there's a lot of 
push, you know, everyone talks about it. We're becoming softer and, you know, we're, we're afraid of that sort of monkey dance. And so we're trying to do things to eliminate it almost. Uh, there's talks of getting rid of football. There's talks of regulating boxing even more and MMA even more. I mean, are we yeah. opening up a Pandora's yeah. box by doing that? I think arguably. Um, I mean, one of the kind of cool uh, things I've read, and again, in the work of sociologists, um, is arguments for the reinstitution of a dueling culture, for instance, in inner city neighborhoods or in uh, prisons. And they're talking about specifically a culture of boxing duels. And the point of this is that what you have in an inner city neighborhood, or many inner city neighborhoods, and certainly in uh, serious prisons, are cultures of honor without dueling codes. And if you are going to have a culture of honor, a culture where men are incredibly touchy about self about disrespect, and willing to uh, claim respect with physical violence, you don't want to have that kind of honor culture without a dueling code. Because if you have that kind of honor culture without a dueling code, then you get things like Hatfield, McCoy, blood feuds. You get things like prison shankings. You get things like drive-by shootings. So the idea of a, of, a, of a culture of boxing duels would be that it makes those other forms of violence dishonorable. It makes it you, – you're branded a coward, and you have to eat a lot of shame if you go outside of the dueling code. So I think there's at least an argument to be, to be made that in certain situations, a reinstitution even of, of uh, dueling codes could be a good thing. Um, so oh, I just had a question, but I, it left my mind. Okay, yeah, I wanted to like hit the point. So you, the big point here with like ritual combat or ritualized violence with, within humans and even animals, the goal isn't to kill your, your opponent, correct? It's just sort of yeah, to you, tough, rough them up yeah. a bit. That's right. That's right. Normally, with what happens with ritual combat uh, among animals, for instance, is almost always it doesn't come to a real fight because the animals will pose at each other back and forth. They'll puff up. They'll bluster and threaten each other. And one guy will look at the other guy and say, "Hey, you're bigger than me. You look like you're fitter, and I'm just gonna I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna cede this territory to you." They only have a real fight if they're very evenly matched. Um, and then at some point, the weaker guy taps out. He says, okay, 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 you win. He backs down. Uh, and that's basically the way it is with people, too. You know, there's, 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 there's systems built in um, where we're able to determine who the better man is without having to fight it out to the death. Gotcha. All right, so your book is called Why Men Fight. Um, is, what does the research say about why men are drawn to violence more so than women? Is it biological? Is it cultural? Is it a mixture of both? What's going on there? I think it's, I think it's largely biological. Um, you know, we're animals. We seem to like to forget that, but you know, the, the, the stallion differs from the mare and the cow differs from the bull and the female chimp or gorilla or monkey differs from the male version. And they differ not only in their bodies, but they differ in their behaviors. And why should it be different for us? So wherever you go around the world, you'll never find a society where men don't do the lion's share of the violence. This is throughout human history. Uh, it's across cultures. I mean, there's literally never been a documented example where women did most of the fighting, where they did most of the warring, and where they caused most of the social chaos in the group by, you know, causing fights within the group. And human males have been shaped by this evolutionary history of violence. It's why men are bigger than women. It's why men are faster. It's why even in trained athletes, men have much higher cardiovascular capacity. It's why men are stronger. And it's also affected our behaviors and our psychologies. It's why men are more physically aggressive. It's why men are more prone to taking really idiotic risks. And it's why men are more willing to resort to physical forms of aggression. Now, all that said, this isn't to say that culture plays no role. And it's not to say that everything about gender is biologically determined. But when it comes to these questions, the questions that I'm looking at in my book, 
questions about um, violence, about intensely competitive behavior, about physically aggressive behavior. This is where the, the sex differences are at their most massive, and it's where the biological roots of those differences are least controversial. Okay. And so you, the second part of your subtitle is why we like to watch men fight. So why why is it? Everyone, I remember everyone's probably had that moment in high school where, you know, there's like meet, there's going to be a fight after school. So you go to some undisclosed location, you form the circle, and like you get really excited watching yeah. this. I remember you, you get the chills, right? And you get the, you uh -huh. get the hair lift up on your, but it's exciting. Uh, yeah. Why do we like to watch men fight? That's a great question. And that's a great example of it. And that really brought me back to my own childhood. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think there's at least a couple of answers to this. Uh, and I started thinking about this really intensely as I was working on the book and as I was watching a lot of cage fighting. And I'd be thinking to myself, you know, I'm a civilized person. I'm a peace-loving person. Uh, I'm apparently not a sociopath. So why am I watching this? You know, what's wrong with me? And what's wrong with us all? Because, you know, even if you wouldn't be caught dead cheering at a cage fight or a boxing match, almost certainly you consume a huge diet of violent entertainment in your movies, in your films, in your books, your video games, and so forth. So part of the reason I, I, I mean, this is kind of an uncomfortable truth, but I do think it's a truth, is that we all claim to hate violence while we're you know, stuffing it into our heads at all times. We're, we're spooning it up, saying that we hate the taste of it. But the truth is that we seem to like violence. You know, there's a creature in us that likes violence and likes it more than we like just about anything else. But there's a other side of this, I think. You know, um, when it comes to an, a fight, when it comes to a sport fight, I think what draws us in is not so much the barbarism or the bloodlust. So I don't know about you, but... I don't ever want to watch an ISIS torture murder video. No, no. And I don't think most people want to watch it. But I find it very hard not to watch men fighting. And I think because it's because it's such an incredibly intense drama. You know, it's such an incredibly intense spectacle, and the men have so much riding on it, and it's real. You know, it's truly reality TV. And, uh, you know, so a fight will set up these conditions of – incredible adversity that allow the best elements of human nature to shine through. So talk about things like courage and, and boldness and extremes of grace and endurance. So I think I will sound to many people like an apologist for violence, but I think what draws us into combat sport as viewers isn't like that we're succumbing or we're reveling in the worst aspects of human nature. I think we go to a sport fight to honor and to celebrate the best aspects of human nature. That's kind of what uh, Joyce Carol Oates wrote about. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's a, she wrote a fantastic book. That's one of my yeah. that's really my favorite book about fighting, uh, her book on boxing. Um, but she's, but she's, you know, like all of us, uh, she's flopping around a little bit. She's trying to figure it out herself. What am I doing watching this stuff? Mm -hmm. And I think she uh, is even more ambivalent about it than I am. I mean, she uh, ambivalence is the proper attitude, by the way, to, to a sport fight, I believe. I think we should be kind of repelled by it. I think we should feel morally... Uh, uh, compromised by it to some degree. Um, but there's also something noble about it, in my opinion. Yeah, you you, you quoted uh, William James, that is the steeps, that uh, it's sort of like an anti-war yeah. uh, essay, but he was basically making the case too, if we didn't have war, we'd sort of lose those chances to display nobility and courage and I'd be kind of boring, exactly. basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the steeps of life is a great line. Yeah, it uh, is. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that's, you know, once I read that line, I was like, oh, that's what we're after uh, in, 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 in mixed martial arts. These are young guys who um, are a little bored of, their, of, their, of the flats of life, of these flat roads of, you know, the softness and ease of life. And they want this steepness. They want this challenge. They want this Everest to climb. That's the kind of quest that I was talking about. Yeah. So I'd like to get your opinion on this after going through this whole experience. Are you still training mixed martial arts? Do you still go to the gym? 
Um, I I uh, I expected to fight for to, to to train for a year, have a fight, and quit. Um, I continued f- training uh, for another two years afterwards, and then I had to give it up basically because I was just too beaten up. Yeah. Um, so I do kind of I do go back in now and then you know, every few months. I'm like I get itchy for it and. Uh, I miss the guys, and I go in, um, but I'm just not holding up to it physically like I used to. Yeah. So it sounds like you developed a really great camaraderie with these guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, uh, I, yeah, there's something about, there's something it's something weird that happens. This is one of those things that I just wouldn't have known if I hadn't done it. Um, but there's something about a sport fight and about sparring in particular that really draws guys close together. You know, one of the things I, one of the lines I, I wrote in my mixed martial arts diary that I that I wrote in every night after training was that there, there's this weird paradox that that nothing makes men love each other so much as a good natured fist fight, <laughs> and it's kind of true. It's, it's, so yeah, I, I, so that was one of the hard things about giving it up was I was giving up this uh, the physical challenge of it, but I was kind of also losing my peer group. Yeah, yeah. I, I call it aggressive nurturing. It's what guys do. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's right. I think it's right. And there's, yeah. some, there's this weird, I call it this weird pathetic alchemy, whereby guys transform aggressive words and aggressive actions into terms of endearment, you know? Yeah. I punch you in the shoulder and, I, you know, it's, it's violent, but it means I love you. Yeah. You know, I call you some name, but it means I care for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And there's this weird process of translation that, that men are able to uh, automatically translate, whereas I think women are like, what? What Are they, are they mad at each other? Yeah, they shouldn't do that. Let's stop that. <laughs> um, so through your experience, your training, I mean, okay, we live in a society where effectively we've outsourced protection to the state. You know, we have police officers, we have a military that 1% of the population serves in. And most, for the most part, society is safe. It's not a very violent world, despite what the news says, but at least in the United States. Yeah. Um, I mean, is there any reason a man should, like, be capable of fighting and being tough and strong? I mean, should a man strive for that for any reason? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh I guess there's a couple ways looking at this. First off, you know, I'm 40 years old. I live in a suburb. Uh, it's middle class. Um, violence is, you know, less and less likely to occur uh, to me. You know, I'm less likely to get into a monkey dance with somebody. I don't cross paths with, with violent men on a regular basis. But not everybody lives in a neighborhood like I live in. Sure. You know? Um, and for young guys, especially, I think it's, it's, it's much more likely that you'll find yourself in these monkey dancing situations. Uh, so yeah, I, I feel like there's a still a role for self-defense, practical, uh, self-defense, but I think more than that, there's a self-respect angle to it. Don't you think? Like, yeah. I think that whether or not you're going to be violent or, or face situations of violence, you still, in order to sort of respect yourself as a guy, you want to be able to feel that you're capable of handling yourself and you're capable of defending yourself and defending the people that you love and you care for. So I, I, I do think that there's a sort of, even though this, this I don't know, we're less, we're less likely to, to need it, it still is part of our makeup, you know, to, to want to be able to handle ourselves. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I, I agree completely with that uh, sentiment. Um, through your training at MMA, did you find that it provided benefits in other areas of your life? Did it like was there carryover? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, you know, part of part of what I was I was after was self respect. You know, I, had, I I you know part of my my own personal history of violence was I'd never been in a fight. And I had dodged uh, quite a few fights in my adolescence. And it's weird how much psychic weight that put on me. You know, like even as a 40-year-old, I'm still able to look back at how I behaved when I was like an undersized, you know, 15-year-old getting pushed around by bullies. And it still has the power to, to fill me with shame. Weirdly, man, you know, yeah. weirdly. But all, all I've accomplished, the things I've done... They matter, but but still, that stuff makes me blush. So, um, 
part of – so there was carryover, yeah. I, I, w- I, w- I wanted to know whether or not I was a coward, you know. I wanted to know if I was capable of doing something brave. And for me, getting into the cage and, and fighting – was scary and it did take bravery. And so I was able to kind of prove to myself that I, you know, I'm not the bravest guy in the world or the toughest guy in the world or anything like that, not even close, but I was able to do what was for me a brave thing. Would you recommend other men do this? Um, the Dutch translation of, of my book, the, the title, which they didn't consult me on at all, is called Real Men Fight, <laughs> which is a horrible title, you know? So I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that you have in order to be a real man you have to fight. Um, I'm not saying that you know I'm not suggesting that every guy in order to feel like he's truly masculine uh, has to be a, a you know a trained killer. Um, but I think a lot of guys are attracted to it. You know they they you know we've watched these you know we watched Bruce Lee movies as kids or John Claude Van Damme movies and we've wanted to be that guy. And so for guys who are interested in it and do have uh, and do lean in that direction or have wondered about it, I would definitely recommend doing it. I think the main reason people don't do it more often or most guys don't do it more often is because they're afraid of it. They're afraid <coughs> excuse me. Uh, they're afraid of the violence. They're also just afraid of walking into the gym for the first time and what it's gonna be like. And I know that because I was too, and everyone who, who goes into the gym for the first time is scared. But if you go in there, you know, you're not going to get, uh, you know, beaten up on the first night. You're not going to get strangled to death on the first night. Uh, it's, it's a pretty nice and nurturing atmosphere. So, yeah, I, I'd, I'd recommend it. I mean, if I could just say one more thing, there's uh, a political scientist who had this little phrase that I liked, and he had visited West Point, uh, the, Ameri- the, the, uh, the military academy at West Point. And he, and he described West Point as a little taste of Sparta or a little mm-hmm. touch of Sparta in the midst of the American Babylon. Wow. That's you know, cool. So you have this society that is sort of, I don't know, it's soft and it's, uh, it's all iPhones and Twitter and consumerism. And then you go to the MMA gym and it's very gritty and it's very real. And you're doing things that are very gritty and very real you're kind of back in Sparta and you're with your, your friends, you're in this sort of warrior band and you're working to make each other tougher and stronger. You're cooperating and beating the fear and the timidity out of each other. And, uh, it was just a really positive experience for me. So yeah, um, I have a a bit of a convert zeal for MMA, you know? (laughs) So I, yeah, I recommend it to everybody if, if you're interested. But if you're not interested, uh, I understand that too. Sure. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I, we just we really did just scratch the surface of what what's in your book. Um, but where can people find out more about your work and about the book? Um, they could uh, Google me. Oh, I have, I have my website. It's JonathanGotchall dot com, or they can just Google me. Okay, great. Go check that out. Well, Jonathan Gotchall, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it, and I. Uh, I'm a big fan of the whole Art of Manliness project. Thank you. My guest today was Jonathan Gottschall. He is the professor of the book, The Professor in the Cage, Why Men Fight and Why We Like to Watch. You can pick it up on Amazon.com. I recommend you go out and get it. It is, again, one of the best books about masculinity I've read in a while. And it's just really, it's got a great story because you get to see what happens to him when he finally fights and enters the cage. So go get it today, Amazon.com, The Professor in the Cage. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And if you'd enjoy our podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you'd go to iTunes or Stitcher, whatever it is you use to listen to the podcast and give us a review. That would really help us out a lot. Also recommend us to your friends. It's one of the best compliments you could give us. So until next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly. Thank you.